Happy Sabbath. What a blessing. Once again, it is to be in God's house today as we contemplate a very serious topic. I, before we get into the message, I want to ask you a question. Think back in your own experience. Have you ever had a time where you were convinced that you were right in whatever it was, Amen. but you found out you were wrong? Have you had that experience before? I think we all have, and we can learn something from that. I'd like to just share a couple of examples uh, with you as we ponder our message today. Which remnant am I preparing to be part of? Which remnant? As we uh, get into the message, please just bow your heads with me once again as we ask God's blessing. Father, we thank you that we can open the Bible together. We thank you for freedom. We thank you for your love that you show us in many ways every day. We commit our time to you now. May we have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit speaks to us individually in Jesus' name. Amen. So have you been, uh, for the students, have you been getting ready for a test and you spent hours and hours studying for the test to find out you studied the wrong chapter? Have you had that experience? I have, actually, and uh, it's definitely not a good one. Another one. Uh, when we moved here to Southern California from Tennessee about uh, 12 years ago, I guess it was now, um, it was Julie's first time to drive in Southern California. Uh, the roads can be confusing, can't they, in this area? So Julie was in Riverside, and she was planning to go visit some friends in Loma Linda. She got on the 91 freeway and started seeing different signs that said beach cities. And uh, she saw 241 South. Uh -oh. What kind of uh, experience do you feel when you know that you think you know that you're right and yet you are wrong? Right. Challenging. Sometimes you have frustration, sometimes you have anxiety, sometimes you have a, f a fear that comes in. Isn't that right? You know, these are things that happen in our human experience, but the same thing can happen spiritually. We can think we are on the right road. We can think we're doing the right thing, but yet we can be on the wrong. It's a serious thing. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's a very solemn verse, isn't it? It should encourage all of us to be thinking very carefully, how can I make sure that I am on the right path? Amen. Let me ask you, how many people does God want to be on the path that leads to death? None. The Bible is exceedingly clear in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but what? But that all should come to repentance. That begs another question. Is it easy to repent? Well, that depends. Be careful how you answer. I uh, shared a message several years ba back, and it was entitled, It's Easier to Live After You're Dead. Amen. Think about that carefully and consider it in this context. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, the Bible says, The carnal mind is enmity, or it is hostile to God. So is it easy for someone who is living in the flesh to repent? No, it's not. But God doesn't give up on us. And so God showers us, each one in this room and those watching online, God has been showering you personally with unnumbered tokens of his love. Can you say amen to that? Have you seen that God has been good in your life? And it's his goodness, the Bible says in Romans 2 verse 4, that leads you to repentance. This is really the whole crux of the matter in our message today about which 
remnant are we going to be in? Which remnant are we preparing for? It is this. Have we allowed the goodness of God to change our life? Because it is not good that comes from within that is going to save us. It is the goodness of God that will change and transform every part of our experience. Will everyone allow God's goodness to change their life? No. I'd like for you to open your Bible once again as we ponder these words we find in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. It's a very solemn thing uh, that we are going to read. The disciples came to Jesus, and they had a question. Their question is found specifically in verse 23. They said, Lord, are there few who are saved? Jesus told them some very important words that we find in verse 24. He says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. There's a very important word in this particular text in verse 24. Very important word. I'd like for you to ponder it with me. It is the word strive. And as you look at the word and you see the Greek there, if you like to learn some Greek, it's there in the English um, translation, agonizomai. Can you see a term there that we understand? Agonize. To struggle. Literally to compete for a prize. Strive, Jesus said. This is the point. How are we striving? Are we striving in our own strength? Or are we striving in the strength that came from the one who agonized for us? Amen. Ponder this with me. In Luke chapter 22, verse 44, we find another text that's describing Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Can you see Jesus there? Can you see him? What was he praying for? Three times, what did he say in the garden? He said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. What Jesus was agonizing for was the will of his Father in his life. He had felt that he had superhuman agony, it says in Desire of Ages, because the sin was literally crushing out his very life. He agonized in a way that none of us are called to do. But it is his agony that will empower us to strive. Amen. It is his agony that will empower us to strive to enter in to the narrow gate. I'd like for you to read something today. It's in Signs of the Times, December 2, 1897. You know, I, when I share messages, I like to give you more information so you can continue digging into the subject. Read this article in Gethsemane that talks about the agony of Christ and shows what he was willing to do for each one of us and each one of the members of the human family. We need to look at Jesus. We need to focus our attention there. As we consider his agonizing prayer, I'd like to share this beautiful statement with you. It's very thought-provoking. It's from the book Prayer, and we are reading the, this book together at 6 a.m. every morning. We have a little prayer group that comes together. This statement is very powerful. And it was specifically in context of Jesus agonizing in the Garden of Gethsemane. In what contrast to this intercession by the majesty of heaven are the feeble, heartless prayers that are offered to God? Many are content with lip service, and but few have a sincere, earnest, affectionate longing after God. That's the difference between the two remnants that we're going to look at. One remnant is seriously focused on Jesus. They have an earnest desire to 
overcome. And they are overcoming in the power of Christ. The second remnant could be just content with lip service. I'd like to share with you the habit of millionaires. Why? Because we can learn some very important things from five habits that these people have. You know, we're told that there are many who are very serious when it comes to earthly, temporary life. Very earnest in business enterprises. You know the stories of people spending hours and hours, spending their whole life to amass a fortune that can disappear in no time. But we can learn something from how these earthly men and women are striving for what they want. What are the habits? There are five of them. By the way, there are notes for this message. I'm sorry this week was a little bit challenging for us, but um, I was not able to get a handout uh, printed for you. But if you go online to the church bulletin for today, July 9, there's a PDF you can download and uh, I hope that'll be a blessing to you. So these five goals. Number one, take personal responsibility. Can we learn something from that? Those who are seeking to strive, they're striving to have success in this life. Can we learn something as Christians who are striving to overcome, who are striving to be part of God's special people? I think we can. Number two, they practice intentionality and are very self-disciplined. We had a message about this before. Is it important for us to practice self-discipline? Through the power of Christ, we too can overcome and be temperate in our lives. They're goal-oriented. These people who are so set on amassing fortunes or building businesses or whatever it is, they have goals that are very concrete. Do we have goals? Have we sat down with the master planner, Jesus himself, and said, what are your goals for my life? Have you done that? I would encourage you to set goals with Jesus as your guide. They are hard workers. People who are dedicated, not just nine to five, but 95. People who are serious on this earth. Can we learn something from that? Does God want us to be Christians just part of the time or all of the time? I remember several years ago when the Blue Zone videos were coming out and Dan Buettner from National Geographic was being interviewed and he talked about those seven-day Adventists. I thought that was great. Do you remember that interview? Yes. Seven-day Adventists. That's what we should be. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, striving to glorify God, being serious about our commitment to what God has done to us because he's so committed to us. And number five, consistency. Those who are successful in this temporary life are consistent. God's faithful, overcoming, remnant people will be consistent as well. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, we will be consistent by his grace. I'd like to ponder another phrase that's in this verse. The narrow gate. The narrow gate. This should bring our attention to another scripture. There's a parallel passage to Luke chapter 13, and it's Matthew chapter 7. We're going to turn there, but I'd like for you just to ponder this. Narrow gate. Narrow can also be translated straight. Straight as in small, straight as in compressed. Now, is it easy to go on a narrow passageway or one that's very broad and you have a lot of different options? Which one is easier? Well, again, it depends how you answer this one. Sometimes if the, if the options are too many, you can get 
on all kinds of rabbit trails. I mean, you can spend hours wandering here and wandering there, but if it's a narrow way, it's going to be easier. Amen. And so this is what God is saying. Yes, it's going to be tough. That is what is implied by this verse, but it is easier. And that's what we understand when we see the picture from God's perspective and not our own. This is a picture of Petra, that great rock city. And the gate was very narrow. It was there for protection as well. You didn't just get into Petra easily. There was one way reminding us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This is the parallel passage, Matthew chapter 13, chapter 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to where? Destruction. Destruction. And there are many who go in by it. As we ponder our message, which remnant are, am I preparing to be part of? Are we preparing to be part of? This is key. It's key to understand that there are many who are on their way to destruction. And the challenge is to make sure that we are not on that, that we are on that narrow way, and that we are not deceiving ourselves. Let's look at this as we continue. Isn't that a beautiful path? It's the narrow path through the mountains of life. Let's look at the characteristics of God's faithful remnant and compare that with the lost remnant of Revelation. Open your Bible with me to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. I'm guessing that many of you have heard this verse many times in evangelistic sermons and other messages, but let's notice and remind ourselves the characteristics that this remnant has, and by God's grace, let us reaffirm our commitment to be part of this people. Revelation 12, 17. The dragon, who's the dragon, everyone? Satan, the devil, was enraged or wroth with the woman. Who's the woman? The church. And he went to make war with the remnant of her offspring who keep the commandments, listen carefully, keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So if you're taking notes, you're writing down that this remnant keeps the commandments of God. Is it your goal to keep the commandments of God through the power of Jesus? Through the same way that Jesus kept them, empowered by the Holy Spirit. The testimony of Jesus is precious. I hope that you were listening carefully as, as Tim read that beautiful paragraph for us talking about this gift that God has given to the church, the testimony of Jesus. Satan is trying. He's got one foot on the Sabbath commandment, and he's got one on the gifts of the church, specifically with the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10 makes it clear that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 14. Could be just one page over there in your Bible as we consider this remnant. They are described again. They are the ones who are giving the three angels messages of Revelation 14, but they have these characteristics. Notice the first is very clear, and it's exactly the same as we read in chapter 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So in this text, we see the same thing, keeping the commandments of God. Are the commandments of God important? Oh, yes, they are. How can we keep them? By his amazing grace, through the strength that comes through daily consecration and the power of the Holy Spirit. Just this morning, we were praying together about what the Holy Spirit does when he is active in our life. And the power that came at Pentecost will be far surpassed 
by what God will do in the final movements, the final hours of Earth's history. I want to be part of that little remnant that is going to be exalting the banner of God, holding the commandments high. Do you want that in your life? They also have the faith of Jesus. And yes, that Garden of Gethsemane experience that Jesus had is something that we too should develop. Not my will, but thine be done. That is the challenge. That is the challenge that God has given. And yes, there will be a remnant that develop this faith, the faith that Jesus had. There's a little uh, compilation that I found. It's called God's Remnant Church. Have you read it? Any of you here? It's a little compilation. It's only 63 pages. I encourage you to go to the Ellen White app or go to Ellen White Writings and look at this and see the beautiful truths that we can learn about God's Remnant Church. Now, let us ponder the characteristics of the lost remnant. In Revelation chapter 19, Revelation 19 describes a very solemn event, a very exciting event. It is the second coming of Christ. Amen. How many of you are looking forward to that? Amen. Jesus riding on that white horse, King of kings and Lord of lords. In Revelation 19, we find two suppers. One of them is the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's talked about specifically in verse 9. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do you want to be part of that? That's the remnant who's going to enjoy. The true remnant is going to enjoy that marriage supper. But Revelation 19 talks about another supper. It is described specifically in verse 17. It's called the Supper of the Great God or the Great Supper of God. It's a frightening supper, and you don't want to be part of it because this is where the lost remnant are found. Notice with me in verse 19. Verse 19, it says, And I saw the beast. Who's the beast? The papacy that we find described in Revelation 17 and 18. The beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, apostate Protestantism, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Let's just pause right there. Does that phrase sound familiar to you? The lake of fire and brimstone? We read about it in the next chapter in Revelation 20. We find that at the end of the thousand years. But this is not the end of the thousand years. This is the second coming of Christ. There are two times that there is a lake of burning of fire and brimstone. God does not want any of his people to be there. But I want for you to notice verse 21. This is where the whole idea came for this message. And the remnant, it's the exact same word that we found in Revelation 12, 17. And the remnant were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. That's the great supper of God. They are the supper. That is exactly correct. God does not want anyone to be part of this remnant. The challenge is this. Satan knows that very well. And he is working with all of his cunning to get people to think they are on the narrow road that leads to life where in reality... They are on the broad road that leads to destruction. Right. How is it that we can make sure that we are going to be in the right remnant? We need to ponder it carefully. But let's look at these characteristics and think through them once again. 
The remnant here described that is lost is deceived by the miracles of the false prophet, apostate Protestantism. We need to understand that what's happening in our world today is orchestrated by the devil in many ways. There are so many things to divert our attention away from God. And there are so many rabbit trails that we can run down instead of focusing on Christ, being deceived by the miracles. That's a whole other sermon in its own. These people receive the mark of the beast, and they worship his image. Again, things that we can study later, but we want to ask ourselves a question. Are there going to be any who are surprised to be part of this group, the lost remnant? Yes, there will. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and 22, Jesus made it very clear that there will come a time where many will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these miracles? Didn't we feed the homeless? Didn't we give Bible studies? Didn't we do these things? And Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, or who, those who practice lawlessness. It's a serious message. These are people who say, Lord, Lord. These are people who thought, they, they were not expecting to receive this answer from Jesus. They thought they were in the right, but they were wrong. They were deceived. You've got to read this as well. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, there's a, I think it's chapter 22, but it's on page 128 is where it starts, and it's called The Two Ways where we see that there is a very clear picture given of those who thought that they were right and were convinced of it. They even had on their clothing, on their outward appearance, dead to the world. That was the profession. But in reality, they were on the broad road that leads to destruction. So this begs the question, how can we be sure that we're in the right remnant? We're going to look at three things right now. Three steps that we can take now and every day of our life to make sure that we're in the right, on the right road. Number one, keep Jesus the focus of everything. Amen. Not just a little compartment over here, not just some time here, but everything needs to revolve around Jesus Christ. We need to really learn this lesson from John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What does it mean to behold? It's not just a casual look. It's a fixating, trance-like looking at Jesus, contemplating him, thinking about him. That's what it is. Behold the Lamb of God. How's it been with you and with I this last week? Have we beheld the Lamb of God? Let us make a commitment to behold him in his beauty. I love this from Our Father Cares, page 34. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated every truth in the word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, must be studied in the light which, that streams from the cross of Calvary. It doesn't matter what part of the Bible you're reading, look for Jesus. Look for the Savior. He is there. You will find him. If we study with this in mind, we will have an invigorating experience with God every day and every time we open the Bible. How can we do it? Three things. Be sure to start the day with Jesus. Amen. This is a practical thing. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm tempted to start the day with this thing. Don't do it. Don't fall for it. Start the day with Jesus. Start the day with Jesus. Number two is a practical one that uh, someone recently told me about. They said, you know... 
Uh, we have phones. I mean, we have watches that are marking our body movement, right? They are sedentary monitors, and they're set for every hour. They're, well, they're set to detect movement. If you don't move uh, within an hour, it gives you a buzz or a little vibration. Do the same thing. If you're struggling to maintain a connection with Jesus, literally set an alarm every hour just to remind you and reconnect, reconnect with God all throughout the day. And of course, in the day with Jesus, go over your day with him. John 5.39 tells us very clearly that we need to find Jesus in every scripture. We need to look for him, not just to read the Bible and say, yes, checked it off. I read my one chapter today. Look for Jesus there. And John 15, verse 4, abide in me and I in you. That is the first characteristic that we need to have to be part of the remnant. Number two, we need to hide God's word in our heart. Hide God's word in our heart. Number one, what is it, everyone? Keep Jesus the focus of everything. Number two, what is it? Hide God's word in my heart. The Bible is clear about the importance of this. Psalm 119, verse 11, let's read it all together. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Beautiful text. We need to develop, and if you've already developed, to increase our habit of memorizing God's word. How can we do it? Here are two resources that I believe can be a blessing to you. For those who like tangible things, something you can put in your hand, little note cards, join FAST. FASTmissions.com is a wonderful way to memorize the Bible. Very practical. It has little verse packs. You can learn all kinds of things, and it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. For those of you who like the digital realm, you need to download the Bible Memory app. There's uh, many verses that you can memorize. They even have a, a group for Bible teachings and doctrines and so forth. It's fantastic. But the point is, memorize God's Word. And it's so encouraging. I love being part of Mentone because we, when I go to the different Sabbath school classes, I hear our children singing the scripture. And that's exactly how it was. Much of the Bible was sung in times past, hiding God's word in our heart. Joshua 1.8, turn with me there. It is a beautiful text, and we are encouraged, and we are uh, inspired to do something specific with the book of the law, as Joshua was. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. That's the, the key point. Meditate day and night. Have times to spend with God reading his word throughout the day. Not just there in the morning or in the evening, but throughout the day, scattered throughout. Just like I know many of you receive text messages throughout the day. I know you receive emails. I know you receive notifications. If you have a smartphone, which I know the majority of the world does these days, we need to receive the notifications from heaven. Those little words of encouragement from Jesus. Joshua 1.8. Meditate on the word of God. And follow Jeremiah. Jeremiah 15, 16, your words were found and I ate them. Did you eat well this week? Point number three in our message. How can we be sure that we will be part of God's true, faithful remnant? 
his people in the last days. Point number three, believe his prophets. All throughout history, those who have believed God's prophets have prospered. Those who have rejected God's prophets have suffered. That's just the reality of it. Let's turn to the Bible. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Open your Bible with me to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Let us notice very specific counsel that is so important in our time. 1 John 4 and verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but do what? Test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Especially now, there are not just thousands, but there are millions of voices calling for our attention. Watch this. Listen to this. Do this. What we need is to test the spirits. And what do we test them with? The word of God itself. Test it carefully according to God's plan. Amos 3 verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. We are blessed. We are blessed when we follow God's prophets. One more text and then uh, another resource that I want to share with you. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Second Chronicles 2020. If you want 2020 vision, believe the prophets. If you really want to know how to navigate life, believe his prophets. God is good. There's a resource I'd like to share with you. I'm curious, how many of you are familiar with the Spirit of Prophecy treasure chest? Anyone here? Couple of hands. It was uh, printed in 1960, actually. Um, uh, when we had our first service, there were a few people who said, yeah, I remember when that came out. I even have one in my house somewhere. They said, make sure to get it and look at it because it is powerful. If you are questioning the validity of Ellen White as a messenger of the Lord, if you have specific doubts even, read this. This is amazing. It is powerful. How do you get it? Well, it's not in print as far as I know, but you can download it from our website. I attached it to today's a bulletin as a PDF file. You can download it. It's 160 odd pages and it is important. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And if we lose our hold on what the prophets have told us, we will lose our vision. We will end up thinking that we are on the right road where in reality we're on the wrong. So may the Lord help us. Each one of us have decisions to make in life. Each one have challenges. But God wants us to be part of his remnant. How are we going to do it? We're going to keep Jesus as the focus of everything. Hide God's word in our heart and believe his prophets. Is that your desire today? Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope and pray that this service has uplifted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and that you personally have been drawn closer to him. If you have any questions or comments, please text us at 909-492-0738 or email us at office at mentonechurch.org. We look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.